Thanks, Andrew. Very kind. Well, look, it's, it is an absolute privilege to be here, and there have been some great lecturers in the past. I feel a bit of an outsider. I'm not a brand expert, a brand academic, or a brand manager. Uh, so this is intimidating for me, but I hope having an outside perspective uh, is interesting. Um, effectively, the question is the one of the title, uh, Are Brands a Form of Corporate uh, Bullshit? That's might as well say it. Um, I apologize for using that word. It basically, I have just written a book which was sort of conceived in about 2012 and was going to be called Peak Bullshit. Um, and then 2016 came along, and uh, it sort of felt like we'd only been in the foothills uh, at the time the book uh, was conceived. But what the book has taught me is the word bullshit has now more or less got a sort of currency, and it is the only word that really describes the phenomenon uh, that we are assailed by, often in the corporate world, more often I'd say at the moment, perhaps in politics. Uh, but also in our daily lives. And it's, bullshit is not just lies, it's not just um, a deliberate attempts to mislead, it just includes a whole lot of stuff that is sometimes detached from facts rather than uh, completely sort of deliberately weave, weaving their way around them. Corporate bullshit uh, is something I'm sure you all encounter in your daily lives. One of the best examples in the book which I will just show you, just to prove there is such a thing as corporate bullshit, as in the title, um, is from the Barclays annual review, uh, annual report in 2007. So this is at a time when Barclays was cheating on LIBOR, selling PPI insurance, diddling the small businesses with the fixed interest rate stuff. And it, you know, the annual report says, in all of this, the customer is absolutely central. If we're to make sustainable banking successful and successful banking sustainable, we must put our customers at the heart of everything we do and build our services around them. And it goes on and on and on. We must earn and keep their trust by ensuring that the products we sell are understandable and appropriate. And I can't think, really, of a better example of something that is just sheer bullshit. I mean, it is written into the annual report. Um, and, by the way, pretty harmless, because no one would have believed it at the time anyway. I mean, it is literally just a vacuous uh, load of nonsense. So, in a way, uh, we're in interested in whether brands are in the same category, whether brands are in some sense of that category. Now, there's a second question, which is very much related to that one, which is, are people gullible? Now, the reason there's a relationship between these two is that if brands are bullshit, they presumably bullshit us in order to, you know, sucker people into buying their product. If people are not gullible, then the bullshit is just the sort of vacuous Barclays annual report type. And then we would think it's a bit weird that companies invest so much in it. You wouldn't, you know, an annual report doesn't cost much. You can write your bullshit in there. But would you write, would you invest so much in bullshit unless people were gullible? So I see the answer to both these questions as highly linked. And I think the question, are people gullible? is a really interesting one in 2017, because there's a sort of ferocious public debate in politics about whether uh, it's, it's among metropolitan elites, who I think are probably overrepresented in this room, if I'm honest. Um, but it's about, it's about whether people who voted for Trump or Brexit were somehow gullible. And there's a very simple kind of mental model, which is prevalent among a lot of people I mix with, which is that people were lied to, they believed the lies, and they voted the wrong way. I mean, that is a sort of a very simple mental model. And it is a, the underlying assumption is that people are gullible. As it happens, I've never met anyone who thinks they're gullible, only other people are gullible <laughs> who voted uh, in a way that they didn't agree with. So I think, are people gullible is a really interesting question, highly related to that one. Now, there's another way uh, of framing the question. Uh, which is uh, sort of quite a dominant one you're going to hear over the next uh, 40 minutes, which is, can rational economics explain the whole brand phenomenon? Now, I'm an economist, and the sort of the basic economic models, the simple suite you learn at university, until behavioral economics came along in the last 10 or 15 years and became a big thing, 
was all predicated on the kind of the, the economic equivalent of assuming frictionless surfaces in physics. It's the simplifying assumption is that people are pretty rational. People know what they're doing. They maximize their utility. They make sensible choices on their own behalf to reflect their own preferences. And companies make sensible choices too. So economists have this very sort of simple view of the world. And you know what? It does get you quite a long way in explaining things that happen in the world. But economists have a slightly odd relationship with brands. Because on the one hand, economists don't want to believe brands are bullshit. Economists don't really believe in bullshit. They may speak a lot of it, but they don't believe in it as a phenomenon because it's irrational. If you tell me your product is good when you sell it to me, I would be a bit dim to believe you because you would say that anyway. Um, so I get no useful information about your product when you tell me it's good. So you won't even bother telling me it's good. So economists don't really believe in bullshit. So they don't want to believe that brands are bullshit. However, economists also don't really want to believe that brands are magic. And a lot of the brand literature, they'll read that and they'll say, no, that literature is, is bullshit. Um, economists really want to believe, or rational economics, really wants to believe brands are conveying useful information. And that brands have a kind of an information function. So that was what rational economics wants to believe. And an interesting question is, can rational economics get you very far in explaining what I know a lot of people in this room do? Now, it's a really interesting area in this, and Nobel Prizes have been won for this whole area of the relationship between information and markets, between what the seller says and what the buyer believes. And economists have come to believe that because, <clears throat> because consumers are rational and won't believe stupid things that sellers say, and because sellers have no credible way of telling the buyer, my product is good, that markets often don't work. And there's a very famous piece uh, of economics that did win a Nobel Prize by George Akerlof uh, about the market for second-hand cars. Do, do any of you know the market for lemons? It's a very famous economic paper very readable, and he just analyzes how the market for second-hand cars doesn't work because I can't believe the seller when the seller says the car's good. I don't know whether the seller has looked after the car. I don't know whether this car was a, you know, a, a, a dud, a lemon out of the factory or whether it was a good one, and so I will always pay a discount for that car when I'm buying it. And it, it's, it's, it's a really powerful paper. And the economics... Of, of, of markets puts an enormous weight on the asymmetry of information. The buyer knows what the product is like, the seller doesn't know what the product is like, and so the seller can't believe the buyer, so we have a problem that the market doesn't quite function. So information as a barrier to or impediment to the efficient functioning of markets is a really important piece of economics. And as I say, one that, has, uh, one that has really kind of been dominating a lot of um, economic theory over the last 20 or 30 years. Right, so we've got these kind of questions. Are people gullible? Does economics, can economics explain brands? And is it all, or is it just all bullshit? And in a way, these are going to be, uh, be the questions I'll be answering. And I ask these partly because I'm an economist, so I'm interested in how economics deals with brands. Also because... Um, I've written a book on it recently, and so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's in my head. But also, because I believe in introspection, and I have a small suite of brands that I actually know I have an attachment to. And I want to know, am I gullible and stupid in buying or having faith in these brands? I, I can actually tell you, I will never buy Nike trainers. I don't know, don't know why, but I will not buy Nike trainers. I'll always buy Adidas. I wouldn't dream of using Bing. I just I hate the name, and I never, ever use it. I will use Google. Um, I'm not quite... I, I love Honda, and I've got a Honda motorbike, but I haven't got a Honda car because it just didn't make sense. So, I mean, there's a limit, right? There's a limit. There's a limit. Um, and, and 
Diesel, FT. These are, these are brands that I like. So I, I'm capable of introspection, and I'm also a believer in making sure that your model is consistent with your own actual behavior. Because, uh, and I like to think of myself, by the way, as an intelligent guy. So if, the kind of, if we're going to find that people are gullible, well, then uh, that's you know, a, a, a lesson for me. So look, here we go into the, what I think is the kind of the benchmark the benchmark model that people have in their head, the brand equivalent of the, the Brexit voters were dim and they were lied to and they voted the wrong way. The benchmark model, which I call the exploitation model, is this. It's, it's the one that you might say comes out of the uh, marketing of cigarettes in the, in, in the 50s. You know, the advertising tries to give you a sense that there's a scientific healthy story to be told about cigarettes. It is bullshit, it is obvious bullshit, and maybe some people believed it and smoked Chesterfield cigarettes as a result of this claim about scientific effects on smoking. So that's the kind of the benchmark model, the bullshit model. I call it the ex exploitation model. Companies promote a self-serving message, our product is safe, and then the public believe what they're told and make bad choices as a result. So that is the bullshit model. That's the bullshit model. That's the one which I know economists don't really want to believe because they don't think the public will believe stupid things uh, if they're told them by the, uh, by the people who have an interest in saying them. So then we go to a contrasting theory of brands. And this, I think, is the default economist view of brands. Rational economics is not exploitation. Its brands are simply labels. They convey useful information. The companies tell us what their product is. The public rightly believe what they're told, and they make their choice accordingly. So it's like the cover of an Ed Sheeran C CD tells us that Ed Sheeran is the subject of the CD, and so you buy that CD. And that's, I suppose, the label model, where the brand is telling you what's on the tin, basically, and you need to know that in order to buy the product, and that, uh, that, that, that works very nicely. Now, there's a very interesting, there's a very interesting, I, I think this is not, just to cut to the chase, this is not going to explain the vast brand phenomenon that we observe. But I think the labeling function of brands is more important than most of you probably think. And I think there is a very straightforward confusion sometimes between the labeling function and the kind of magic brand function, uh, which the brand managers often talk about. So I would take the example of Nescafe. I think, I think, this is unsupported assertion, okay, so don't necessarily believe it. I think what Nescafe is doing on a jar of Nescafe is telling me it's Nescafe. And I think the coffee inside the jar is the best instant coffee. Never drink instant coffee anymore, but don't put, put, put it aside. So Nescafe, as a brand, is adding nothing. The brand is simply labeling the product. Now, that, that is interesting for you guys, because some of you will want to say the brand is very valuable. But I don't think the brand is valuable at all. I think the coffee is valuable and the recipe for making the coffee. And if you are a label, then the brand doesn't have value, it's the product. And far too little of the attempts to understand uh, brand values try to make a distinction between the name and the underlying product. And you know, I've had this conversation with Rita uh, before, Rita Clifton in her interbrand days, I think that was a little, I think that is a problem. I think that is a problem with the Interbrand Global 100. That in the Interbrand Global 100, quite a lot of what you're getting is labels for very good products, and quite a lot of what you're getting is brands that add value to not such good products, or to quite good products, but which are, where the, the, the brand is, is, is adding. So let me give you um, some examples. I think, Apple adds value to a smartphone. If Apple produced a Samsung smartphone and put the name Apple on it and the Apple on the back, 
it would sell more and at a higher price than it does a Samsung. So Apple is a brand. It's more than a label. However, Microsoft, which is also in the um, interbrand, current interbrand global top, top 10, Microsoft, I don't think that adds anything. I don't think anybody buys a product because it's Microsoft. They buy the Microsoft product because it's the Microsoft product. They don't think, oh, that name makes me want to buy it. They just think, that's what my computer has on it, so I'll, uh, I'll buy it. And I think that, that distinction is a really important one. But the label model, that whole idea that the brand is simply conveying information, is the, what I would say is the sort of simplest economist view. And that would say, look, it isn't bullshit, folks. It's conveying information. But that would never, ever justify all the work you put into brands. So I don't think that quite does it. And I don't think that explains why I buy diesel. Uh, because diesel's no better than lots of other things, but I still nevertheless buy it. So we can get to more sophisticated economic theories, all still based on information flows, the conveying of information that the brand is somehow informing the consumer of something useful. And the next one we get to is the brand signaling model. Now, some of you might have heard about this in Rory Sutherland's very excellent 2011 brand lecture, where he went through uh, some fairly similar ground. But the brand signaling model um, says the brand isn't directly telling me something, but the weight of effort put into the brand is indirectly signaling to me some honest information about the brand. Okay? So this one says companies implicitly tell us about their commitment to the product and the public draw useful inferences from that <clears throat> about product quality and, and their choices. So in the book, I go through just a, a random example. T-Mobile launch in the United States, and they employ Catherine Zeta-Jones as their brand ambassador. Now, what is the point of employing Catherine Zeta-Jones as the brand ambassador? Is it that the public will think Catherine Zeta-Jones is an expert on mobile telephony and so I will do what she does because she's, she's endorsed the product? I doubt it. The public knows she's paid just to say T-Mobile. Is it that Catherine Zeta-Jones fans feel a connection to Catherine Zeta-Jones via the phone? Possibly. But no, I think that one is a really simple example of the company the information you get by the employing of Catherine Zeta-Jones is T-Mobile are serious about entering the US market, so they paid a celebrity who costs millions rather than having just cheap little ads uh, in the you know, penultimate page of local papers. It's a, it sort of gives you, it gives you a sense of commitment. It's like having big marble buildings for banks. It's a, it's a signal, an implicit, subtle signal that there's something going on here. And that's why I sort of call it uh, a stellar artois. You remember the old slogan, reassuringly expensive. That is, a, that is a function of brands. They are reassuringly expensive. All the work you do, obviously a waste of time in sort of direct ways, but it just tells us they've thrown a lot of money to these very well-paid people in black, you know, T-shirts. And you know, that tells us they're pretty serious. They wouldn't do that if they thought they were here today, gone tomorrow. Um, so they're serious about their product. So that's the brand signaling model. And that one really is loved by economists, or rational economics, I should say, because that one really does imply the consumer is rational to listen to the advertising. You don't want to listen to the advertising. Don't take it literally, but take it seriously. You know, that's, the, that's absolutely that... Uh, that model. And, and I, I, I think there's something in that, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting uh, theory. Economists can go one step further on brands being informative. It's not brand signaling, but the next one is the ostentatious consumption model, which is rather than the brand trying to signal something, the brand is advertised in a way or marketed in a way that says something that makes it associated with something. And great pattern-spotting human beings say, I could signal something about myself by adopting that brand, or wearing that brand, or displaying it ostentatiously. 
So that one says, people choose brands to say something about themselves to other people, and brands become part of the language, and then doing so, furnish useful information. And status is the most obvious thing, you know, that the luxury goods, that the Rolex watches, all these sort of cliched examples, which, um, which, which tell you that you're rich, basically, useful piece of information, and an honest piece of information. Very hard, if you, unless you fake the Rolex, very hard uh, to, to wear a Rolex for long without actually being rich, so it's a great, great signal. Uh, it conveys useful information. And so as long as Rolex can make sure that everybody knows only rich people wear Rolexes, then the Rolex enters the language as a symbol of, uh, of status. But it's much more subtle than that. Of my um, book launch, which was at Daunt Books in uh, Marylebone, um, you know book launches. You invite 100 people, and they're all really expected to buy a copy of the book. Uh, and a friend of mine got his Daunt, you know, his fabric daunt bag with a copy of my book in it, and he said, I'm so embarrassed, I'm going to walk out of here with a, one of these stupid daunt bags, you know, and look like some sort of bookie person. Um, but in a way, all our consumption, all our consumption is ostentatious, and, and, or quite a lot of it is ostentatious, in quite subtle ways, we say a lot of us. And again, this is an information theory. It's a theory that says the brand carries some information. It's not bullshit. It's carrying useful information. In this case, it's not the brand marketing itself that's carrying that information. It's, 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 it's carrying information uh, between us. So another theory that rational economics can clutch onto to say, hey, we can explain. We can explain a lot of this phenomenon uh, using mo models, essentially, in which information is the issue Information is the issue, and rational people can find an explanation or reason to use brands in the way they do. Use a brand just like you lose langu use language. This, by the way, ostentatious consumption, uh, is it malign or is it a benign use of corporate, uh, corporate product? Well, it can be malign. If, if, if a company can persuade everybody to, you know, get into an arms race, a status arms race, in which they're trying to, with their trainers or with their jewelry or with their handbags, to try and compete with each other, to outdo the other in, in, in status terms, buying ever more expensive products. The companies that can make themselves a piece of the language that is a sort of status symbol, they do very well. And it would pay the population to say, you know, let, let's have a true, let's, let's collude, let's, let's not engage in this arms race. Let's have a, a treaty that says none of us will buy these trainers to show off and then we'll all be better off uh, and we won't be giving so much to the, uh, to the manufacturer. So yes, sometimes this is a malign, a malign piece of um, you know, communication, but often, more often, the Daunt's book, you know, Daunt book bag example, it's not malign at all. All it is is just a way of honestly communicating something about yourself uh, and using the brand, using the brand rather than being abused by the band, uh, being abused by it or exploited by it. So what we have is we have at least three models, and there are others. We have at least three models where information is key and explains brands. And I think your average neoclassical economist, the ones who were fashionable before 2007, uh, I think your average neoclassical economist would say this goes a very long way to explaining the whole phenomenon. Economics is saved. The world is rational. We can explain all this stuff in the kind of language, the language of economics. Um, perfectly possible, by the way, that brands can be a combination of these things, an ostentatious item that people consume to communicate about themselves, they buy it because they've had a reassuringly expensive signal of uh, quality or commitment by the manufacturer. Um, and it could also be um, that the brand is, to some extent, simply a label as well. Right. So if we believe all of that about the brand phenomenon, that would be that. But do we really believe that? <laughs> and I think the answer to that is no. Do I buy diesel clothes for my 
off work wear. Do I buy diesel clothes for those reasons? And I introspect quite hard on this, and I honestly don't think I do. Uh, I don't think I wear, the, I wear them, so it's ostentatious in that sense. But I, I think people would be quite hard pressed to tell it's diesel. I mean, some of it has labeled, but not all of it. Um, and it just doesn't, to me, seem to capture quite, quite where the brands are. And this is where I think one has to say you need to get beyond, you need to get beyond the, rational, the rational economic models and look beyond. Now, some of you will know that in the last uh, 10 years, with the failures of rational economics to predict things like financial crises and where the world goes, uh, there's been a very much more predominant interest in behavioral economics. It's really on the nexus of economics and psychology. Uh, it takes economics from a rational world to the real world. And usefully and in a timely way, the Nobel Prize for Economics was given this week to one of the people very much in the forefront of, uh, of this area. And essentially, and this crosses with Rory Sutherland's 2011 lecture, essentially, you should be reading Daniel Kahneman, fast thinking, slow thinking, and in that, he says, we have a rational brain, our system two brain, but we also have an instinctive brain, our system one brain, um, not particularly imaginative labeled system one, system two, but there we are, system one is your instinctive thought, that's what you do when you find your way home on a route you're very familiar with, um, system two is your conscious thought. That's what you do when you're trying to, trying to read a map and work out a route home. As if anyone reads maps these days. I mean, it's all sat now, isn't it? But that's the sort of, that's the kind of um, distinction between system one and system two. The traditional economics is very much embedded in system two. But in virtually every area of economics in the last few years, people have said all the action is in system one. All the action is not in trying to find a rational model by which a brand is conveying information from A to person A to person B, or a rational model that will govern anything. All the action is in the way things play on our system one brain. And uh, a lot of you will be aware that there are these so-called heuristic models of brand value. Heuristic models which really are built around how brands play on our system one brains, how brands can dig into our mental shortcuts and affect our beliefs and feelings about things. Now, in the book, I take an example. It's not a brand example, but a, a way in which system one thinking, our instinctive brain, can be manipulated to believe something and it's psychological pricing, the 999 pricing. So, and interestingly, the ebook was priced at 999, so it was a good, a good example. The, um, and it works. The truth is, it was a fantastic example of this. Mail order company sent out three versions of the same catalog. In one, all the numbers ended, you know, on round numbers, zero, zero. In one, they all ended in 99. They were one cent lower, and in one, they were all 88, just to kind of make it a controlled test. And the one that sold best by, by about 8%, there was an 8% uplift for the 99, the 999 priced ones. Um, and that was, you know, a powerful thing for the owner of the mail order company who refused to do any more, any more research on it because he'd made up his mind that psychological pricing worked. So that's an example, a good example, of how... You can, you know, 9.99 is bullshit, right? It's 10, um, but it sounds better. And so it's a good example of how you can play on our instinctive thought to get us to warm to things. And these heuristic models, which uh, Rory Sutherland outlined in the 2011 lecture here, um, are very interesting. And I think they do go quite a long way to adding to in a sort of behavioral, psychological way, adding to what you might call the rational economic models. And you might say they're all about information. Because the 999 is about information, 
but it's about playing on a kind of shortcut we take. The, the, the supposed shortcut, I mean, there's a whole lot of theories, but one of the, we might only look at the first digit of the price. That's the shortcut we take, so nine sounds less than 10, so we buy 9.99 more than we buy 10. Um, so it's all about, the heuristic models are all about getting information across, but by drilling into a little door in the head, sort of finding a little latch door into the brain where you can get in, play to the shortcut, and, uh, and, 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 do, and do stuff. However, 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 I don't even think these heuristic models quite do it because the way the heuristic model is meant to work or the way the kind of the mental shortcut or the system one thinking is meant to work is you're meant to play on people's, you know, quick decision making. It's when they don't think about it. But I observe when I buy diesel, I really, really have thought about it. I'm quite conscious of it and I absolutely stick to the same behavior as I would if I was being instinctive about it. It's not that diesel have found a little shortcut into sort of manipulating my brain to make me think something uh, about you know, their brand that is like 9.99 versus 10. It's not that at all. I have had plenty of time to ponder and I still find myself uh, buying that diesel product, which I think then does get you, and this is flattering to those of you who work in brands in the audience, does take you to the more kind of magic models. Now, I think these are, by the way, rooted in our instinctive thinking, our emotional brains rather than our rational brains, but I think it is the case that there's a difference between a Thomas the Tank Engine biscuit and a plain biscuit, and it's not that you have, if you like, exploited some mental, you, you've adopted some mental trick, you've basically done something far more clever. You've, you, you've effect, effectively created a psychological pull and public, quite reasonably, for well, a child in the case of a Thomas the Tank Engine biscuit, allow themselves to be juiced, seduced by it. And I think in the end, I'm afraid to say, as a a sort of neoclassical trained economist, I think you just simply cannot avoid, when you come to brands, concluding that there is something in, something in these models. That there is something, that an emotional attachment of some kind, that makes a product more appealing if it has just the right mix or the right qualities or just hits the right mark. It's not a heuristic, it's not a mental shortcut, it's actually just wanting, uh, wanting something about it. Now, we know that brand managers know this. And it explains, for example, why perfume, uh, perfume manufacturers, expensive perfume manufacturers, don't want their product on sale in Superdrug and have fight, fought quite hard to stop their product on sale in Superdrug. They want it sold in a different retail ambience because they know there's just a difference between that product sold in one ambience and sold in a different one. Interestingly, very interestingly, they don't mind them being sold in duty-free shops, which are no better than Superdrug. But duty-free shops have this very, very special quality that it feels like there's a, a reason for the discounting. But there isn't really a reason for the discounting in, in, in duty-free shops. I mean, there's a VAT difference. But the, 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 you know, it's not about the, the, the VAT. It's actually, it's more like there's an excuse for putting it in a, in a, a discount in a duty-free shop. There's no excuse for doing that in a, a super drug. So you don't want it in super drug. Um, it's, a, it's a very good example of how there is just simply the ambience, the feel, something is going on there. And effectively... There's a system one brain, an instinctive reaction to certain brands uh, that, 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 you know, these things add value to the, the basic functionality of the product. Now, is this irrational? No. Is it rational? No. Is it information? No. 
It's none of those things. It is just that sort of magic addition. And as I say, I'm afraid I just can't think of any, uh, of any other way to get to my own introspection view of where I am on those brands. I have a feeling about them that I quite rationally can think about and say doesn't make any sort of particular rational sense, apart from the Financial Times, that's obviously uh, rational sense. But, it, but it's not about rational sense, but it is just something that gives me a pleasure to buy that product rather than the other one. So I think it is neither rational nor irrational, it's just on a different scale. It's not about information, and your traditional economics can't really uh, explain it. Now, is this bullshit? Is my adherence to these products... Should I think of that as bullshit? Should I think of myself as in some way being manipulated or exploited? And the answer is obviously no. Absolutely obviously no. And I'm going to give you four reasons for why I think it is not exploitative or in any way unpleasant. One is that I'm a willing accomplice. You know, I, I enjoy it. Two... I, um, I would resist it if it, was, if it was bad. If they started blatantly ripping me off, I would turn against it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy the product. Um, three, and most crucially, there is no information asymmetry. The problem that the economists have identified of information asymmetries is a very real one. It's, it does impede markets. Brands can often provide information, useful information, that help overcome the information asymmetries and which can be honest in their disclosure. However, there is no information. Diesel, honestly, know more about their product than I know. I know where they are in the value you know, list. I know the quality. I've been with them enough to know what I'm going to get, what proportion of the things I might buy from them I'm actually not going to like or turn out to sort of buttons fall off after a bit. I just know. I, I, there's, there's no information asymmetry. There's nothing going on there. And if there's no information asymmetry, it's not like, you know, Boris Johnson tells us 350 million gullible consumers believe it, gullible consumers swallow it up and buy it and, and vote accordingly. Um, and the final reason why there's no ripoff is that my, my desire to buy those things survives my rational thinking. So it's not just an irrational thing. I was talking at a, a book festival recently, and someone mentioned a section in the book which talks about the John Lewis ad, the Christmas ads. Coming soon, folks. And they said, because I, I, I wrote a sort of few paragraphs on the Christmas ads, and the suggestion was that those ads are manipulative, and I am being manipulated by them. And I think the idea of the willing accomplice to manipulation is a really important one. If I'm a willing accomplice to the manipulation that is going on in that ad, as, by the way, I am, I will go and look at it and probably cry, and then I'll, um, you know, think about it, from, forget about it for another year. If I'm a willing accomplice, I think, and if there's no information asymmetry, if it doesn't, if, if, it, if I know enough about John Lewis not to be trying to sort of frame an opinion of John Lewis on account of this ad, that ad is not in any way able to manipulate me. I, the only analogy I can think of is my dog, actually, Mr. Whippy the Whippet. And I, he, <laughs> does he manipulate me? Certainly he goes to the door and barks and I let him out and then he wants to come in again and I let him in and, you know, he looks at me cutely and I feed him, I give him food. Now, is he manipulating me because I'm giving him what he wants and he's learned how you know, to, to get into my head with his little cute expression? Well, yes, in a sort of way, he has learned to manipulate me, but I'm a very willing accomplice to that process. I like having the dog. I don't mind opening the door for him and feeding him. It gives me pleasure. And if it gives me pleasure, it doesn't make sense to think of the dog as, in some sense, a manipulator of... Uh, of, of, of the owner. So the willing accomplice theory, I think, is the one that explains my relationship to these, uh, to these, to these particular, particular brands. It's an aesthetic quality. 
And I'm not going to get into what it is, that magic. That's what you guys do. I'm, I'm the economist. All I'm saying is I don't think the economics on its own gets you to the kind of, you, you need that. It's something to do with poetry, my desire to tribalize or feel an allegiance to a certain class of people, a desire to have a conversation in my head with the brand, even if um, I'm not actually having a conversation with anyone, uh, with anyone actually, uh, you know, no actual person. It's not about showing off, and it's not about information. Now, saving the idea, coming to this idea that brands are not bullshit, uh, that there's a sort of, there's a magic there which is not exploitative and which is not in any way um, manipulative, is, is quite important. Because there's an, and I'll, I'll give you one application, I'll give you one important application. It's, it's about the development of, our, development of our economy. So for the vast bulk of human history, for the vast bulk of human history, and approximately 107 billion people have lived at one point or another. That's 100, there are 7 billion of us alive today. 107 billion have lived since the dawn of humanity. Um, so we're about, yeah, about 16%, 17% of the entire stock of uh, of, of dead human beings. And um, when you think about them, the way that all but about two billion have lived has been in, in subsistence. Um, or, sorry, not two billion, it's, it's more than, but it's a very, it's the vast, vast bulk of that, of that group, 107 billion, have lived in subsistence. The only thing that has mattered has been function. The food that they eat, the getting something to wear, the vast bulk of their life is about function. Now, between 1 AD and 1700, the economy, or between 1 AD and 1000, the economy barely grew at all. People were no richer in, in, in the year 1000 than they were in, uh, you know, at the time of Jesus Christ. By 1700, the economy had grown a little bit. People were richer in 1700 than they were at the time of the Norman invasion. And then by 1820, things really rapidly started to pick up. And you really quickly got to, you know, incomes doubling every 30, 40, or 50 years. And that makes an absolutely enormous difference. And when you think where society is now, it is quite obvious that people don't want just more and more of stuff. They want to rechannel their consumption into more intensive consumption. They want a more intensive consumer experience. They want a Thomas the Tank Engine biscuit rather than just a biscuit. Um, and that, I think, is sort of where we are. I think it's well put by this um, quote from the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The history of every major galactic civilization passes through three distinct and recognizable phases. Survival, inquiry, and sophistication. Or he calls them how, why, and where phases. The first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where should we have lunch? <laughs> and once you enter that phase, where should we have lunch, you are, your, your consumption is no longer about function. It's no longer about, I just want the, the best one, the, the, the most functional one. It's I want the one that looks nicest. I want the one with the nice packaging. And in all these respects, I think that is where our relatively wealthy society has gone. Uh, and so what a branded product can be is a bundled product. It's the product and the function with a little bit of magic, poetry, or story bundled in with it. And people will pay for that because there's only so much washing powder, so many jeans, so many cars that people will ever buy for themselves. Now, this is, um, this is important for another respect, because Britain is the country that industrialized first, and Britain has got a pretty good, you know, Britain arrived at the where shall we have lunch phase relatively early in the kind of evolution of human, evolution of human history. And I think it is no coincidence that the country that was first into industrialization was the first into thinking about, or among the leaders, into thinking about how do we 
intensify people's consumer experience rather than just simply add volume to it? How do we make it a more, a more holistic and interesting experience? And it is an interesting point that the British economy, the one that is perhaps a global specialist in branding, marketing, thinking about the kind of the soft stuff that goes with the function, is one of the ones that is hardest to measure. Now, many of you will have heard that there is a sort of productivity gap in this country, that we, we, we are much less productive than our other G7 counterparts. The hourly output is lower. And I want to raise a question. I'm not going to say this is very important in explaining the gap, but I do want to raise a following and a rather interesting question. If a company adds value to its product by spending a lot on making a little bit of magic around it, and if it puts its price up as a result of that, is that encapsulated in our GDP figures? Now, in principle, it should be, because the company will make more money, and that will be counted in our GDP figures. However, if the price rise is deemed by the statisticians just to be inflation, then it won't be counted. They'll just say, that's not real GDP, that's just inflationary GDP. So the statistician's job, the ONS, these people who tell us what inflation and GDP is, is to work out when they see products over the years getting more expensive. Their job, or maybe not getting more expensive, by the way, I mean, maybe they're just getting better. Their job is to work out, is this product inflation, is this inflation, or is this value increase? Now, if you believe in a bullshit theory of brands, well, then you're believing that actually companies are just ripping us off, they're telling us stuff that isn't true, they're getting more sales or putting their prices up as a result, and that's just basically a transfer of resources from us to them. That's just basically inflation. If you believe that they're making the product like a better product because it's nicer to consume the product once it's had this advertising than before it's had this advertising, well, then you're in a world where ad value is being added. But that value is very difficult to measure. That value is very difficult to measure. So it's possible, and I don't think this is, I'm afraid, going to explain the 20% gap between us and the French, it is possible that there's a small amount of unmeasured value added going on in our economy in this department of brands. But it relies on the brands adding value, not being bullshit, but being genuine product-enhancing pleasure for the buyers of that product. Now, I would think there is some of that. I think there probably uh, is some of that, and so I'm, you know, a believer. Uh, but that's probably why I've been invited here to talk to you, because it would, wouldn't work to have a speaker who doesn't believe, uh, who believes it really is all bullshit. So I, I think there is something in that. I don't think it would have an absolutely enormous effect on the productivity figures, but it may be that our economy is just more complicated than a lot of other economies where they churn out manufactured goods and where it's easy to count the value of them because you just count the number of them. Uh, and our economy is just a little bit more subtle because we're big into brands and trying to make them the, the consumer experience more, more altogether, um, altogether intense. So let me conclude and let me um, sum up. Three questions uh, I asked. Are brands a form of corporate bullshit? Well, I'm afraid I can't give you an absolutely definitive answer in all cases that you're not uh, peddling bullshit. It would be unlikely that there's no bullshit because there's so much bullshit in every other walk of our lives. I'm afraid I think there probably is some bullshit there, but not usually. And I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that people are stupid. Can rational economics explain brands? No, not entirely. You have to go beyond the mere thinking about information. I think you do have to allow for a bit of magic. And I think that's a, a powerful lesson for the economists. And it even goes a bit beyond the heuristic models of kind of brands cleverly marketing themselves. And then very importantly, are people gullible? Well, I think it's important to stress here 
one doesn't want to be too doctrinaire about this. Yes, there are some pretty gullible people, and yes, there are some pretty stupid people. However, should we fall back on the idea that people are stupid or gullible as a kind of explanation of either brands or elections that seem to go in a way that you didn't expect or you didn't want? I think not. I think it is far too easy to look at things and to draw that sort of false conclusion that to, to, to ascribe a causality. You see that Nescafe is heavily advertised. You see that Nescafe is the best-selling coffee. And you assume gullible consumers are buying Nescafe simply because it's advertised. And I think what thinking more carefully about brands does is tell you that often these causal chains are more complicated than that. Similarly, in elections, you see people told 350 million. You see them vote for Brexit. You think, oh, they voted for Brexit because they believe the 350 million. Possible, a few did. Maybe some did. But there was a high level of skepticism among the public about everything they were told in the referendum campaign. And I think it's too naive to think people were just gullible in voting how they did. They could have voted how they did for a million other explanations protest vote, a change vote, because they didn't like the EU, all sorts of things could have actually explained the vote other than their, other than their gullibility. So that is really the, sort of the end of my words. For me, um, the world is assailed by bullshit. The book is called Post-Truth, because that was a more fashionable term for bullshit uh, in 2016. We are assailed by bullshit. I think we are at a, a kind of, I don't know if I'd say at a peak, but we're at a sort of the crest of a wave. It comes and goes. And I, you know, I, in the book, talk a lot about the political side and how it does go. But of all the areas where there is a lot of bullshit, in politics, in public, public relations, in annual reports and um, statements to shareholders, in all of those things, I think brands are probably not, are not the industry, are not the social phenomenon where you have to worry about bullshit being the explanation of what they are. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> right. Thank you.